Could you check and see if you got one in stock? Oh, you do? Well, that's great. I'll be right over to get it. Okay, bye. Who was Dan on the phone there, Daryl? Oh, you mean who I was just talking to on the phone? That was none of your business. Now I gotta run to the auto parts store. You need to keep an eye on this place. You think you can do that without messing anything up? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I can do that, Daryl. Well, all right. If any customers come in while I'm gone, tell them I'll be back in 20 minutes. You think you can handle that? And try not to mess anything up. Oh, where's the chip bows? <laughs> He got the whiskey mouth. He likes the nightlife, baby. Do, do, do. What's up, dude? You work here? Uh, well, uh, yeah. I'm the executive vice president. Oh, sweet, dude. I'm looking for a generator. You got anything like that around here? You want some chipmunks? Oh, well, uh... Uh, oh, oh, we got one right here. There's one right here. Huh, sweet. How much you asking for? Uh, let's see here. What does it say? Oh, uh, $35.71. What? Oh, no way, dude. That's a deal. Here, here's a hunter. Keep the change. Let's get a couple sodies or some chip was on me. Oh, thanks. Here, let me give you a hand with that. I'll help you load it up. Silver Fox, you? Terrell around here? What? I gotta talk to him. Oh no, Terrell stepped out for a second. But I'm the executive vice president. Maybe I can help you with something? Ha! Really? I didn't realize Terrell had an executive vice president. Well, uh, I'm here to pick up my generator. He called and told me it was ready. Oh, let me go in the back and look and see, alright? I didn't see any generators back there. Oh, really? Well, he told me it was waiting up here in the showroom. Well, I'm not seeing nothing. There was one up here for sale, but I sold it 10 minutes ago. Oh, yeah, 10 minutes ago. Was it a little red generator? Yeah, that was the one. How did you know? Oh, was it? That was, oh, that was my generator. Oh, that was my generator. Oh, I'm filming like an old car right now. I'm filming like an old guy. Oh, I'm sorry, but I don't actually work here. I was just trying to help my good pal Terrell out. Oh, so which is it? Do you work here or don't you work here? You want to help, huh? Why don't you help I get my generator back, you jerk? Otherwise, you're going to be eating a knuckle sandwich for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Capiche? I just had the can of SpaghettiOs for lunch, just like Mama used to make. So I'm not really that hungry. Oh, 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 you're funny, huh? Now, look here, you little jerk. You're gonna get my generator back, otherwise I'm gonna take you out to Podunk Lake and see how long you can tread water in concrete shoes. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, no, oh, yeah. Pterodactyl here, and today we're gonna get this here old antiques Briggs and Scranton engine running. I got four of these engines at an auction. I got a 6S, two WIs, and this here WM. You know what WM stands for? It's an abbreviation for the name William. William Briggs. Big Billy Briggs is what they called him. That's his name. No. No, that's not, that's not what WM stands for? What's it stand for? Washing machine? Yeah. Doesn't stand for William Briggs? What, what's Briggs' name? 
Stephen Foster Briggs? What's Scranton's name? Uh, Harold Scranton? Mm hmm. Oh, so, oh, yeah, that makes sense. WM, washing machine. These were engines that they used to put on washing machines. I thought the WM stand for Big Billy Briggs, William Briggs. All right, I looked this thing up. Okay, still got the, still got the tag on it from the auction. All right, so I looked this engine up, this WM was made between 1936 and 1940. It's a half horsepower, and this one has low compression, but it does have spark. But the compression, compression is low. So I went and evaluated all four of the engines I got. We're gonna do a separate video on, on each one. So I went to my manual, this old manual that I got from my brother Farrell, and look at this thing, it's got the numbered series engine breakdowns in there. The 5, the 5S, the 6. It's got all the part breakdown. Look at this, it's like brand new. It's like nobody ever went in this section. This part of the book had never been touched by human hands. It's got the alphabetical series, which is what we got. And then I went to the WM part. And one thing I learned is, a lot of these parts are still available. I didn't know the WM, the WI, the 6S, the 5S, the 5, all them, all use the same head gasket and valve cover gasket. See, look, they still make the head gasket. And there's the part number, 27463. We're gonna need a head gasket because we're gonna do a valve job on this. It's got low compression. Piston's going up and down, no compression, or low compression. And here's the valve cover gasket. And there's the part number on that. That is 67527. 67527. And the points and condenser are still available. There's a condenser. 29861 and there's the points 29667 so this engine was used on a washing machine can you believe that they had gas powered washing machines and that's something here's the choke and it looks like you could hook a lever to it and then you would pedal start it to get you kickstart your uh, your washing machine, and here's where the belt would go up to the washing machine. So I mounted it to this piece of wood so we could kick it over. I made sure it was full of oil, but no gas tank. So luckily, I had a tank that a Terrell fan had given me last year. <laughs> Excuse me. At Pontiac, when we were in Pontiac, a fan came up and said, Terrell, I saw your video on your Model Y. Because I did a video on a Model Y. And he goes, I noticed you didn't have a gas tank. Here's a gas tank. Now, you can still get these gas tanks reproduction. They're pretty pricey. But the main thing you need is this. This part, the pickup tube, which has a little check valve in it. So we got a gas tank. So let's uh let's start doing a valve job and put points in this thing. Take off the cover here. A couple of screws. And you're probably wondering, what'd you pay for those engines, Terrell? At that auction. I got these engines for twenty dollars a piece. Can you believe that? I got all four for eighty dollars. That was a bargain. Here's our little governor system. Air main governor and throttle. And there's also a spot here where you can hook up a cable. So you can throttle this thing if you need to. Wanted to soup up your washing machine. 
I'm thinking about putting this on something other than a washing machine. So it's got spark, kind of weak, but it does have spark. And the compression is real low. And I got a new spark pump for it. Oh, see, exhaust valve, not sealing. Eh, intake too. That's probably why. Marginal compression. All right, peel that off. We'll scrape all that off and get that prep. Let's take the valve cover off. Seven sixteenths. It's been on there since nineteen thirty-seven. See what do we got? Oh, we got like a little. Little baffle you thing in here. Alright, so I gotta remember how that went in there. That went just like that. Have to clean that up. Now I'm thinking uh Valves should come out just like a standard one. They probably just got those key keepers on there. Oh, they got a pin. There's a pin. So I'm gonna have to get my spring compressor and then pull that little pin out. Okay, yeah, there's a little pin in there. Oh, that's easy enough. Woo, watch it there, little guy. You know, luckily I've got this old spring compressor because this is kind of small, small keepers on here. The other one I have that I normally use was too big. And then magnet on a stick and we take that little pin out. Now we can remove the valve. And then just do the same on the other side. There we go. All right, let me clean them up on the wire wheel and see if I can reface them. These are some tiny valves. See if I can reface them on my uh, valve grinding machine. And pop them springs out of there too. I cleaned up the valves on the wire wheel and this is marked exhaust EX and the other one you know would be the intake. So they definitely need to be resurfaced. This exhaust one's a little burned. So I'm going to put them in my valve grinding machine. We're going to resurface them, clean up the seats, set the uh, valve clearance Put it all back together. Now these are at 45, the face of these. Didn't need much to clean this one up.
like brand new, like new money. Now we're gonna clean up the valve seats. Now, not everybody's got a new way valve seat cutter. They're expensive. So this is my hillbilly way of doing it. You may have seen me do this before on other uh, valve jobs. You just get a piece of emery paper and you tear it like this. And you can just clean up the seats that way. Now, even though I got that big thick manual over there, there's no service uh, manual in there. It's just a part lookup. And I went online and I tried to find the valve clearances on this here motor and I couldn't find anything. So I'm just gonna set them to like all their other engines, L heads or flat heads. I'm gonna set the intake at six and the exhaust at 10. See how that shines that up nice and pretty? Because that's what my channel's about. My channel's about the guy that doesn't have all the fancy tools. That new way valve seat cutter, that thing's expensive. So this is just a good, quick, easy way of doing it. And of course we'll lap them in. So here's the exhaust. Here's the intake. And let's take a look at this little, look at that little baby piston. Little half horsepower engine. And check the bore for this old engine. Look at it. It's not galled up or nothing. Hardly any ridge, there's no ridge on it. This thing might not have no time on it. Whoever owned this probably never washed their clothes. They're probably dirty people. No piston rock. They're probably like, hey, we're not washing our clothes. All right, so you get them to open and close and then top dead center. And then we're gonna check for valve clearance. So here's 6,000. Hey, look at that. That's going right in there, that six, and I cut a little bit off the face. So these valves probably could have just been lapped back in. Let's check the exhaust side with the six and see if we got any clearance. Oh yeah, we got clearance, sloppy. Hmm. Let me get a 10. Try a 10 in there. Oh yeah, 10's, 10's going in and out real easy. So we don't have to grind any off the stem. It's just lap them in. So I got my valve grinding tool, which comes with different tips for different size valves and it's got a little teeny tiny one in there. See this has got that little so it sticks to it good. And then put a small amount of valve grinding compound on here. A little bit. Stick your valve in there. Give it a little turn to kind of smear it around the face. And then, oh, it's not suction cupping very good. Back and forth. You don't have to spin it in a complete circle. Just back and forth. Give it a turn. Go back and forth, turn it. Some holes in that, top of that. Thing. 
valve. They probably had a tool that fit in there for lapping them. Then I always take it up, and you can hear it grind a little harder when you do that. And then as always, make sure you get all that valve lapping compound off of there. You got to clean it off real good with some solvent. Otherwise, if you leave any of that compound on there, it'll just lap the valve to depth and you'll lose your clearance eventually because it isn't abrasive. And then you want to look for a good solid line all the way around. If it's all choppy, and there's something wrong with the valve. I'll take a little carb spray on a rag just to wipe it off. Spray it on the valve. Make sure I get all that compound off. And I'll stick it back in there. And look, can't turn it now. Remember when I started, I was able to turn them with my finger? Now they're sealing. So that's good, that's what you want. So now we'll do the same to the intake. Then we'll put it back together. The only reason I could think them holes are in there. They must have had some kind of valve tool that fit in there and you could... So I cleaned up all the valves and the keepers and I cleaned up the, the little pocket in here where the valves go because it was kind of dirty. The intake and exhaust spring, they feel like they got the same amount of, of spring tension. They're kind of weak. And then we'll put our little keepers in there. And then we'll have to uh, put our spring compressor to it. Put our little pins in. If I put it on there first, there we go. There we go. Let me dig this guy out a little bit. Put it on an angle. Put the little keeper in. Like I said, these springs, they're real light spring weight it help if I put the valve in exhaust let's put the exhaust where it goes let's line up the hole facing us oh should probably put some lubricant on it huh <laughs> you're, like, oh, you're gonna put that valve in dry you're gonna seize that thing up so I'll put some gel lube on there which we sell in our online store. But at the moment, they're all out. They told us they're gonna get some. They just don't know when. This is some good stuff. Good assembly lube. Now I gotta get my spring compressor under that little cap. There we go. Kinda tricky to do with the cameraman in my way. Hard to do with that cameraman in my way.
Maybe I should use a smaller screwdriver. There's the ticket. There we go. Now we got it. And we'll get the magnet on a stick to put that pin in. We can get the magnet to not stick to everything else. You know what? Probably a good little tiny pair of needle nose would probably work better. Yeah, this is much better. Magnet works good for taking it out. Little tiny pair of needle nose works good for putting it back in. All right, there's our dinner. A little tricky, but I know you guys can do it. Now we just gotta do the other side. Okay, I cleaned this thing up. This little part is, I don't know what it does. I could look it up in that book and see what the name of it is. And it worked, since it's an old school engine and there was some kind of, uh, see my gasket sealer on this gasket, you could see. Because you could see the paper there and then there looks like there was some kind of sealer. We're gonna go old school. And we're gonna use this Permatex Indian Head Gasket Shellac Compound. This is good stuff, I like this stuff too. Terrell Fan turned me on to this. And it, you can get it at an auto parts store. And a little bottle like this, I think is about two bucks. So you just dab it on there, both sides, and you kind of let it set and get tacky. Let me set this somewhere. We grab it with these pliers. Get the excess off. We don't need a ton of it on there. Now we'll let it set up for a few minutes and we'll put that valve cover back on. Okay, we let it set up, it's nice and tacky. And then the bolt that holds the valve cover on, it's got a fiber washer on there. That's what helps to make it seal. And you're gonna put it in there Get the thread started. This looks like this might be tricky too. Finding the, there we go. And then you're gonna have to center everything up. The gasket, the cover. And then we're gonna tighten it down by hand. We took it off with the impact. I couldn't find any torque specs or anything on this. Just don't go crazy. <laughs> Tighten her up. Okay. Now I already went and cleaned up the, the deck here. I took my little sanding pad that I got on a piece of rubber and I just kind of lightly went over that. Did the same on the head. Now that gasket, that old gasket, that's a graphite gasket. I didn't know they had graphite back then. Now the new one is also graphite. Now if you know anything about graphite, you know that's kind of like a uh, lubricant because they make a graphite lubricant. So you're not gonna wanna put anything on, the, on a graphite gasket. Now if you look at our bolt, our head bolt, we got five that are one size and one that's longer than the other. So if you look at it, 
this machined area takes those five and this one's a lot higher. So you know the longer one goes here, which is right between the valves. Look at this, look at the cooling fins on there, not many. And no kind of baffling. You know, on their later engines, they put a little plate on here, so that way when the fan was blowing through there, it kind of contained, contained the air to help it cool more. And I noticed on some of them other engines, they had more cooling fins as time went on, so they must have realized that, hey, we need more cooling fins. Again, no torque specs I could find on this. I'm sure some of y'all that are into these engines go, well, what torque spec is this, Carol? You should have asked me. Like I know who you are. You should have asked me. I, I got all the torque specs on that. So I'll just let's just snug them down. You know, just get them to contact. And then we'll, you know, no. No pattern, just kind of going across pattern after you get them up to where they need to be. And I'm thinking inch pounds, maybe 150, 200. This is a cast iron engine. my little baby torque wrench that I've had forever. I'm gonna go 200. Ain't gonna hurt it. Gradually in a cross pattern. Tighten them. Two hundred. Two hundred. Now I said this engine does have spark. It just seemed weak. We're gonna put a new plug in it. This looks like a CJ8 that was in there. This auto light. I'm gonna put a CJ8. Should work. Thirty thousandths gap. And let's uh, before we do the points. Let's hook up this gas tank. There's gas in here. We don't have to rebuild the carburetor because there's nothing to this carburetor. There's no float bowl or nothing. You couldn't put a gas can, a gas tank above this, a gravity-fed tank. The gas would just run in and run out. This has got to pull the fuel up to it. So this is the only type of system you can use on this. So this carburetor should work. I shouldn't have to do anything to it. Now I'm going to try to start it. Well, you know what, well, for safety, in case it starts, I don't want to have that. Fan. It's only two screws to take it off. It's full of oil, I already checked it. Got 
I can freshen now. Here we go. Oh, whoa, there we go. Woo! That might be because of the points. good it's kind of deformed and everything but let's take a look at the points so three-quarter socket whoa that baby's on there let's try this half inch oh we don't wreck anything oh dummy it's got left-handed threads on there it looks like, let me try the other way and see what happens. There we go. Oh man, that could have been disastrous. Left-handed threads. Could have been hammering on that thing with that impact and broke the end of the crankshaft out. That would have been the end of the video. So, I'm gonna pop it the way I always do. I'm gonna put this nut on. Make sure it's flush with the end of the crankshaft. And then I got a little pry bar. And I'm gonna get a hammer. And try to just kind of put some pressure on it by tapping that in there. And I'm gonna whack on the end of the crankshaft. And we want that nice and flush so we don't ruin the threads. Give it a good sharp blow in the center. There we go, there's our dinner, woo! Flywheel off! Ooh, look at these points, right there. No cover or nothing on there. They look to be in good shape. But we need to look at the contact itself. So let's, let's just, Pull them off, take a look at them. Hopefully it's not the coil, like I said. Loosen this screw, these two wires will come right out. And look at them points. They're like brand new. And here I went and bought a set. It might just need to be cleaned. It 
Yeah, they look good. They might have been replaced at some point. Yeah, they got one little one little burn mark on them. Well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna replace the condenser. The condenser is very important. You got a bad condenser, it'll make your points arc real bad. I've seen it before and it'll burn them out quick. So since we got a new condenser, we'll just stick a new one on there. Let's not mess around. And then we'll clean the points. And if it's still popping and spitting and sputtering, we'll see if we can uh, see if we can get a, a spark tester in there and see if the spark is breaking up. Now this wire, it's the same length as the original. No, it's a, maybe no, it's the same length. My concern is it might interfere with the flywheel. So I'm gonna cut it down a little bit. It doesn't need to be that long. So I'm gonna cut it down, strip it back. Because my concern is, you know, it gets caught in that flywheel, you're gonna have no sparkies. And then tuck it in here. We don't want it interfering with the flywheel. So if you never set points before, you turn it until the points are at their widest gap. So I'm going to have to loosen this. I want to get it open here, turn it. Oh, what's going on here with these points? There we go, I can move them back a little bit. Huh, not going up and down. Going on here. It's our point plunger. Oh, there we go. Right there is down. I can feel it. There's a little pin in the back here that them points got to go into. That's what it was. I didn't have that on that little pin. See what happens when you get old and you can't see? There we go. See, now they're opening. So there's their widest point right there. And we want 20 thousandths. We're gonna set them at 20. So you gotta wanna kinda snug it so you can adjust the points. A little oh uh, yeah we're getting close there we go still a little loose I'm gonna loosen it a little more and then tighten it oh yeah that feels good right there tighten that screw down yeah that's that's good Then you'll see them close.
give them a little snap. And then you want to clean them with some paper. I'm going to use this tag, this auction tag. You want to get any kind of residue off of there. So I guess later on they put a points cover on these. All right, put the flywheel back on. Looks like it uses that same Briggs flywheel key. Looks a little longer. Here, there's a Briggs flywheel key. They use that key on everything up until a certain point. You know, Briggs, they standardized a lot of stuff on their engines. For years and years, a lot of parts would interchange. Or if they came up with new models, they would, you know, try to use an existing part. That's how it should be. Should be coming up with new stuff all the time. It's wasteful. Gotta use what you got. Left-handed thread, remember, could have been disastrous. The motor's pretty simple to work on back in the day. I bet you them back in the 30s, you know, put a set of points in my washing machine. Oh, those points are they're, they're 25 cents. 25 cents? How much to put them in? Oh, I don't know. Five dollars? Five dollars? You're ripping me off! Even though they probably didn't even have that term ripping me off back then. You're ripping me off! What does that even mean, lady? How am I gonna wash my clothes? Five dollars and twenty-five cents to put a set of points in? That's highway robbery. All right, let's get this mat out of the way. All right, let's see. Let's see what happens now. New condenser. Choke it. Now don't start at all. They're probably left at all. There we go. This grandma ain't washing her clothes now. In order for this thing to have good spark, it's got to be able to jump this spark tester. And it's not. Oh, there. See, it did for a second. Wish I, had, I wish this thing was better. When I did that Model Y engine, I had real weak spark, and I put a condenser in it, it was like yellow spark. And I put a condenser in it, and I had hot blue spark, and it was jumping across that. If you look at that Model Y engine, that thing runs good. This thing needs a coil. That's why it's running the way it does. So, now I gotta build a time machine and go back 30 or 40 years, figure out when they still made coils for these things, because I'm gonna have to find a coil for it. I can't put a modern electric electronic ignition coil on it, because like in my other video on that uh, concrete finishing machine, when you got the flywheel that's got the magnets that are separated, 
if you put that modern coil on it, it's not going to work because this coil's got three legs on it. So even though I could probably find a Briggs, a new electronic ignition coil, I could probably find one that would fit on here, but it's still not going to spark because this has got three legs on it. And see how the magnets are separated? On the modern ones with the electronic ignition, it's got a solid magnet all the way across. That's why in that one video I had to go and change the flywheel in that and the coil in order to get that thing to work. And luckily that four horse engine, the eight and the ten horse flywheel and, and uh, coil fit on that four horse engine on that one. Look at that, what is that, a bug? So yeah, this coil, well you know what, let's try one other thing. Maybe it's just got a bad ground. But I could tell this coil is kind of distorted, kind of bulgy. But you know, it's also got to have a good ground. Let me try cleaning this ground wire and see if that helps. All right, I pulled the coil off. It looks like somebody wrapped some black tape around this wire here. And another thing I noticed, this crank bearing on this side, got a lot of play in it. But that shouldn't really, you know, affect the spark too much. And this ground wire, it's got two ground wires coming out of here. I'm gonna try to solder that back together. Undo this tape, look at this wire, but this coil might be bad. I'm gonna try to clean up this, make sure the coil's got a good ground, and see if we can get some better spark out of it. So I took that tape off, and somebody had soldered a piece of wire in there, but at least they soldered it, so we know that's a good connection. So I put a piece of heat shrink tubing over it to get rid of that electrical tape. But closer inspection of this coil, you know, it's kind of bulged, which isn't good when it's kind of bulgy like that. I got a feeling that this coil is bad. This is kind of loose. But I sanded everything for a good ground, and uh, I'm gonna try to compensate the air gap for the play in the crank and see if we can get get it to jump that spark tester. If not, I got this uh, friend of mine, Pat, that's into these old engines. He's got a ton of them. Maybe he's got a coil we can put on it. He's uh, one of those engines I bought, that uh, 6S, that's missing the uh, carburetor, gas tank, and air filter, and he said he's got one that he's going to be bringing me. And he also said he had a Ham's cooler he was going to bring me. Oh, I'm curious to see what that is. I said, Carol, I got a Ham's cooler you can have. When I saw that, I was thinking of you. So let me put this back together, and then we'll try it again. All right, I did all that sanding, soldered that ground wire, compensated for the, when I set the air gap on the coil, I compensated for that play, that crankshaft play. It still wouldn't light this one up, but it did light this one. So I think we're still gonna need a coil, but let's see what happens. See that popping and missing? That's an ignition problem. So we're still gonna need to get a coil for it. 
Well, just think about it. Back in the day, this is how they would wash their clothes with a gas-powered washing machine. Could you imagine what would have happened when them washing machines went electric? Just like when Rob Dylan went electric. machines went electric, I bet you them people were all up and up, I'm giving up my gas powered washing machine for the newfangled electric, you're out of your mind. I wonder how many people actually died from carbon monoxide running a gas powered washing machine in their house. I'm sure it was in some kind of shed or something off their house, but you know there's a lot of knuckleheads out there, probably had them in their basement and everything else. <laughs> so I started thinking. Would it be possible to do like I did on that concrete finishing machine? Did Briggs use the same taper and stuff on their flywheels and spacing on their coils? So I thought, you know, if I got a three horse horizontal engine with the heavy flywheel, maybe it'll work on that old WM. So I went out and sure enough, I had a three horse Briggs and Scratton. 80202 model. This one's from 1988. So I took the coil and the flywheel off, and sure enough, they fit that WM. So then I thought, I wonder if that light flywheel would work too on these push mowers. This little four horse vertical shaft push mower with the Plastic carburetor on the metal tank. So I pulled the flywheel off, and sure enough, that coil is the same number as that 80202, which I'm gonna give you. The flywheel is lighter than that heavy one for the horizontal, but it did work. I, it did kick back at me once, you know, because it is lighter. But the only reason I'm telling you about this is it will work because that one flywheel on that 80202, that flywheel is not available anymore. So if you're going to want to do this conversion, you're going to have to find a junk engine. And if that's difficult to find, you could always use this flywheel. And I'm going to give you the part numbers for these flywheels. I did see these on eBay and they were pretty cheap used. Or if you can find one of these mowers, they, they made thousands of them. You could rob the coil and the flywheel off and put it on these, uh, these old 70, 80 year old Briggs engines. So there were a few little modifications I had to make. One is the coil wire isn't long enough. And I didn't want to just take another piece of coil wire and twist it together and solder it. I wanted to make like a nice transition. And I was thinking, how can I do that? Well, the auto parts store, I got these distributor terminals. And the reason I have these 
is sometimes I gotta make new coil wire for those K-series crawler engines. And you need this to go on the end so it goes in the coil. So I just bought a box of these from my local auto parts store. So that's what it's called. Distributor terminal for a coil wire. And this is the number from where I got it. You may be able to do a giggle search on that and find that. And then I thought, okay, let me get another spark plug terminal, a straight one. Now these are the straight ones like you would use on your car, again from the auto parts store. And some Briggs and Scrantons use these, you know, for their overhead valve engines. And they, these I got from Napa. These are Belden. And there's the number for the straight. And what I had to do was, I had to pop this little clip off this little tension clip. I had to pop that off so this would get wide enough so I could join the wires together and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this boot back on here. Now if you want to just join the wires together and solder them and just wrap it up with tape that's up to you but I kind of wanted to give it kind of a cleaner transition by doing this and then now I can hook up a kill wire off of this electronic ignition coil and then I'm going to add a regular kill button. This is a rotary kill button 7302 for like a weed eater and I'm probably going to because there's a space over here I'm probably going to drill a hole in the cover and mount it in there so it'll be up on top to kill it. And now my air vein, I had to slot this hole, I took a file and I had to slot this hole because the air vein was kind of rubbing on the flywheel a little bit. And then you can see I marked it here, so I'm going to notch that out. I don't want to cut this tab off because that's what kind of holds the laminates together on the coil. So I figured I'd just notch this, get it swung over, and then I made a a little spacer that I'm going to put behind here and put the screw back in for the air vein. I just made that out of a little piece of tubing that I had laying around. So either flywheel will work. So here's the part number for this coil. 591420. That's the same for that 80202 engine and then that lawnmower engine is a 10 M it's got some other numbers on it but that's a 10 cubic inch motor and then these are the flywheel numbers which are no longer available either one of these flywheels but sometimes when people are selling used equipment or used parts they'll put it under the original part number so you know it's the right one now you can leave the points underneath here if you want, but those were brand new points that were in there and that was a new condenser, so I took them off. And I'm gonna take the plunger out. And then this is a plunger plug that you get with some coil when you buy them from Briggs in case you're doing a conversion from points to electronic and you wanna take the points out you can put this plug in there. Or, like I said, you could just leave the points in it because you're not going to use them. So let's, uh, let's put the cover on and see how well this thing runs now that we've gone electronic. Now you may be asking yourself, Tara, why are you making coil wires for those K-Series engines? Those Kroller K-Series. I just go to auto parts store and just buy me a coil wire from a car. You're not supposed to do that. That carbon wire, that coil wire for a car, that's got a carbon in it, it's not a metal wire. And it kind of builds resistance to go through even though it'll work. You're supposed to on those K-Series engines, you're supposed to use a, a coil wire that's got metal wire running through it. 
because you're going to burn the coil out. You're going to add resistance. It's going to make that coil work harder and it's going to burn out. So if you got a K-series engine and you keep going through uh, coils, it's probably because you got the wrong coil wire on there. You got to have a metal wire. So I got uh, coil wire on a roll, a spool of it that's got the metal in it, you know, wire in it, regular metal wire. And I make up my own coil wires for those K-series. So that's why I have them terminals, just in case you wanted to know. Oh, okay, thanks, Terrell. Okay, so I went ahead and put the boot on so you could see exactly what I'm doing here. And I kind of wanted it not too long. I don't want it to melt on the muffkin. So I shortened it up. Now let's put the cover on. And fire it up, fire it up, fire it up, fire it up, fire it up. You know who says that? You know why I say that all the time? Because that's what Elkskins would say. Elkskins was in here and he was like, Fire it up! Fire it up! Fire it up! And I went, SHUT UP! Listen to you. Saying fire it up every two seconds. Put joke on. Fingers crossed. It's not starting. now runs now another thing I tried to do was put more tension on that governor spring for the air vein but it doesn't pick up any speed this thing is made to just run at one speed once it was warmed up because I've been messing with it off camera I did get it to idle but when I slowly tried to idle it down it just killed the motor but once I ran it for a few minutes and got it hot if I went like that real quick to idle it was idling so, subscribe to this YouTube channel if you like all this stuff. Follow me, Facebook and Instagram. And as always, there's your dinner. Woo! Francis Scranton, WM, washing machine engine. Did some modifications to it. Got it going, yeah. Electronic ignition, yeah, baby, yeah, baby. Uh oh, Kickstarter broke now. Something else I gotta fix. Always stop. Yeah. Oh. 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 What's going on in here? Oh. What's going on, Terrell? Your executive VP over here sold my generator. He's about to get a pounded. Andy, I told you not to mess anything up while I was gone. I know, Terrell. I was just trying to help you out. You didn't see that generator had a repair tag on it with his name, Anthony, on it? Plain as day. Oh, that's what that was? I thought you had named that generator Anthony. Oh, I want my generator back, Terrell. You better get it back or buy me a new one. Capiche? I'll buy you a new one. It's my fault. That was a thousand dollar generator, Andy. Oopsies. Can I borrow a thousand dollars, Daryl? Andy! <laughs>